Well, thank you uh, for coming out. And uh, I'm Jacob Darwin Hamblin. Uh, yes, that is my real middle name. People always ask me that. I don't know why. I don't use a fake name. Um, I uh, want to just thank you. You're the, you're the humanities uh, festival veterans, the festival warriors. It's the last day. Uh, and uh, I think one of the things that I was worried about when I was coming to talk was that I was going to bring you down when we, really you need, a, you need a boost. Because frankly, many of the things that I'm going to talk about are grim subjects. Uh, and they are, they're not particularly happy, but I am going to make a strong effort to be positive and uh, to try to keep it light. And so you, you will be happy by the end of it, I swear. Well, maybe not. Uh, we are going to talk about some grim, grim topics, and the cover of my recent book is, is a nice indication of that. It's sort of, uh, it doesn't seem very happy. Uh, there's a certain desolation uh, that's suggested in it. Um, so my first way of, of, of trying to keep it light is to, while I'm talking, for you to try to imagine uh, what Richard Nixon, Henry Kissinger, Cindy Lauper, and Michael Jackson have in common. Uh, and, and if you can't think of it, then I'm sorry, uh, but I'll let you know by the end of it. But that'll give your mind something to be distracted about while we talk about some, some fairly grim topics. Uh, I, so I, I mention that because people react very strongly to some of the ideas that are in this book and in talks that I give about it. Uh, and each audience is a little bit different depending on your background. Um, and I think that the book itself uh, Arming Mother Nature has touched a little bit of a nerve. Why? Because the reaction is this. I, I think that it challenges our comfortable understandings of how many of our ideas about global catastrophic environmental change are linked to the collaboration between scientists and the military. Uh, at the beginning of the Cold War and throughout the Cold War. So in some ways, it establishes an alternative narrative about the way we think about the, the environment in some fairly uncomfortable ways. So that, that's what I'm going to be talking about and be thinking about Cindy Lauper and Michael Jackson uh, also, uh, because they go together really well. They don't really. Uh, but I'll, I'll tie it all together before the end. Let me set the stage for you. Uh, in 1960, Chile had the worst uh, earthquake in recorded history, and it wasn't just the worst for them, it was the worst in history anywhere. It was about a 9.5, I think, magnitude earthquake, uh, and it uh, destroyed many cities in Chile, and it also sent a tsunami uh, across the Pacific. It sent it to, uh, to whole, uh, there were 18-foot waves in, in Japan and 30-foot waves in Hawaii, and it was just devastating. And it was one of those moments that newspaper commentators around the world said, hey, you know, we have, we have conquered the atom, we built an atomic bomb, we have, we have cured diseases with antibiotics and developing penicillin, but events like these are reminders that Mother Nature is still in charge and that we need to work together to try to, try to, try to solve some of these problems and to help these people. And, and for many, it was a moment of, of realization, a moment of clarity. Uh, and, and people in the, the armed services in, in Chile together sent supplies to help these people and, and, and participated in rebuilding efforts. The Americans flew supplies down from the, from the Panama Canal Zone to really help. And again, in, for a lot of people, it was that moment of, of bringing people together. I mention it, and here are just some other pictures of just how devastating the, the quake was. I mention it because it's a nice way of thinking about the opposite. Uh, in Paris, which at that time was the headquarters of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, instead of seeing this disaster uh, as an opportunity for, for coming together, NATO scientists and, 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 and uh, officials within NATO were trying to figure out, is this the future face of war? Is this something that we can accomplish? If we can, for example, take a, a hydrogen bomb and put it in a, in a fault line somewhere? Can we actually b bring this sort of catastrophe about? And it was an intriguing possibility, the idea that you can take your knowledge of the, of the natural world and use it as a weapon against your foe. And at that time, the foe was, was conceived to be uh, the Soviet Union and their allies. What, the pictures that you're looking at here, and I'll use my fancy, I wish I had one of these. Uh, this is uh, Theodor von Karman. 
uh, and this is Edward Teller. So here's von Karman. Von Karman, by that time, he was an Austrian. Uh, uh, he was, uh, excuse me, um, he, he was, uh, he was an, uh, a Hungarian who helped uh, advise the Austrian government even as early as World War I, and by this time was known as the grand old man of uh, science forecasting. And he helped NATO to try to figure out, okay, what, what are the future weapon systems? And environmental warfare was one of them. He actually died in the midst of all this, and he was replaced as the chairman of, these, uh, of, of this committee at NATO by Edward Teller, uh, maybe known to some of you as the father of the hydrogen bomb. Some of the ideas that they came up with uh, were pretty shocking from our, from our point of view. I mean, they wanted to uh, imagine melting the polar ice caps with hydrogen bombs, thereby raising sea levels and possibly drowning coastal cities. They were interested in uh, setting entire regions on fire by detonating a hydrogen bomb really high up in the sky and using the thermal radiation to, to ignite forest fires, and that would have the advantage of not having to spread because the forest fire would go up all at the same time. They were interested in weather control, they were interested in climate control, they were interested in biological weapons, they were interested in radiological contamination, and many of the weapon systems that today seem like science fiction. I mention all this uh, now because I, I do want to say that this is part of the book, uh, but the book does in fact have an argument that is beyond just an expose of, of kind of um, uh, th this sort of thinking. But I want to mention this as sort of a funny aside and me keeping it light as well. Um, the, the chapter that talks specifically about what I just mentioned, uh, and NATO's efforts to try to imagine what environmental warfare even was, was excerpted in Salon, uh, which is a magaz an online magazine that maybe some of you have, have heard of or read. Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't write the title of the, uh, of the, uh, of the chapter or what they excerpted. Uh, we tried weaponizing that, what, the weather, and it says, Cold War secrets, melting the polar ice cap with nukes, changing the sea level, even LSD weapons were all on the table. And that's true. Uh, I, I did say that. But one thing that I didn't talk about at all, um, that there, are, there are no aliens in my book, none, none of any kind. Uh, but for some reason, they used this graphic. And immediately, I realized that the appeal uh, of what I talk about is not necessarily always people who are interested in understanding the historical origins of the way we think about environmental change, and I will get to that in a moment. But it's often people who just want to say, can you believe they made, they were even thinking about these weapons? And fair enough. Uh, but s s soon, soon after this happened, this is where my article sort of uh, turned up. The most popular stories on conspiracy websites, here's mine. Uh, we tried to weaponize the weather. You know, slightly less interesting than, than the abductee who says her alien lovers are better at sex than any earthling. I mean, fair enough. It is less interesting than that, uh, right? Uh, I mean, more interesting, though, I was happy that the, than this Canadian story uh, about exposing uh, alien collaboration uh, with the United States. This is one reaction uh, to the argument. What I want to do today is to tell you what I really think, uh, and that is that we often, I'm a historian, and we're constantly talking about why do we actually think about the environment in the ways that we do? We think about global catastrophic change like climate change, and we think about, well, the rise of environmental sciences. We think about uh, activists. We think about science writers like Rachel Carson. We think about all the things in the humanities uh, that, that where, where people are writing about all these different issues, but what, what we're missing in all of that is the elephant in the room. Uh, and, and that, to me, is if we want to know how we came to understand catastrophic environmental change, we need to look at the people who tried to make those happen. We need to look at the science, the collaborative science, with those people who tried to make it happen and to try to understand how vulnerable we are to changes that we have created or that we possibly can create. Why not start with the people who tried to make that sort of thing happen? So, if I have... And this is all the text I'll give you, don't worry. This is actually, you know what, this is a humanities crowd. You're used to reading. Uh, usually I apologize for the amount of text, and it's really just this one slide, don't worry. But you can handle it. I just want to outline kind of the general ideas that I have. One is that 
that this collaboration between scientists and the military created a worldview that was obsessed with change and it was, was obsessed with the possibility of manipulation and it was obsessed with vulnerability, thinking that the Soviet Union is going to do the same thing to us and we need to know how vulnerable we are to it. And if you start to think about that and how similar that is to early environmental thought and early environmental sciences, you will start to appreciate why often it's the same scientists and the same research programs that are involved in both uh, the military side of it and also what we typically think of environmentalism. Uh, so the second one is that actually a lot of the activities, the scientific activities that were being done in the, let's say the 1950s and 1960s actually encouraged the belief that that kind of control, that kind of uh, change and manipulation was already not only possible but may even be already underway. That's just the belief. And the last thing is that Cold War politics, geopolitics, really shaped the responses to the scientific evidence. And I'll give you a little hint. This is where Cindy Lauper is going to come in. Um, you know, I'm just throwing you these wrenches, you know, so you just, just to be distracted. Uh, but it actually is true. This is how she's going to come into it eventually. So here's the grim part. In order to, f to, to contextualize these weapon systems, yes, we could demonize people like Edward Teller and Theodore von Karman if we want, uh, and fine, go ahead, I'm happy to have them be de demonized. But those weapon systems that they are trying to imagine at NATO, they're part of the way that the Americans have already decided the Third World War will be fought. Toward the end of the Second War World War, some of you may know that there was a line that was crossed in, in terms of ethics, in terms of morality, that explicitly said that the way we're going to fight this conflict, and I'm talking about World War II now, the way we're going to fight this conflict is to target cities. We are going to bomb civilian centers of population because they reasoned that it's a total war. Now, they agonized, uh, uh, agonized is not the right word, they thought about the issue and recognized that there was a moral line that they had crossed. In the immediate post-war world, when the Joint Chiefs of Staff was created and all the apparatus of the modern U.S. military was created, they did, in fact, look at this change that happened during the Second World War and said, look, the next one is going to be the same. We are going to be fighting a total war, which means not just armies fighting each other, but entire civilizations clashing. We're going to have to target civilian population centers. And if you put that into into context, and you know that scientists were so involved in the military at that time, and they were the ones who were involved in building the atomic bomb and creating penicillin, it shouldn't be so surprising that many of these same scientists said, okay, if you're going to target civilian population centers, let's figure out some of the most efficient ways of doing it. That's why you have uh, radiological warfare being a major research program at the end of World War II, because it's a period in which, hey, we've got all this radioactive waste. We don't know what to do with it. We still don't have a, a, an ultimate solution. Uh, we don't know what to do with it. Why not put it into a situation in which harm is the desired goal? Also, if you're, you're, you're planning to target human population centers, the best way to do that, the time-honored killers of troops and, and, and people in wartime is not weapons, it's disease. Why not have a robust biological warfare program? Now, by the early 1950s, the United States and the Soviet Union and Great Britain, they all had these programs. They hadn't yet figured out how they were going to, inter in uh, to integrate, excuse me, integrate them into their conventional weapon systems, but they had them because they believed that they needed to in order to fight this, this kind of conflict. They hadn't quite figured out how it was going to go. Let me just give you a sense of how different a time it was. This is a period when, in the 19, early 1950s, while the United States is fighting in the Korean War, you could have very well-known politicians like Al Gore's father, uh, Al Gore Sr., uh, say very publicly and have it reported the New York Times that, you know, what I think you should do, I think we should do, is we should take all this radioactive waste and we should just dump it along the, the Korean Peninsula, separating North and South Korea. Why? Uh, today, we would be horrified to even suggest that kind of thing because it would seem... Uh, inhumane, it would seem e ecologically horrible thing to do, but at the time the reasoning was that would deter the North, uh, excuse me, the North Koreans from invading South Korea. This was not done, and it wasn't done because it, 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 it wasn't not done because of some ethical reason or some moral reason. It was because it just wasn't practical. 
because the army at the time said, well, we could do this, but we don't think it would actually deter the North Koreans. It might give the soldiers cancer later, uh, but we don't think that would actually deter a tank. So for a lot of reasons, this wasn't done. I only mention it to you now so that you have a sense of the kinds of ideas that were on the table at that time. And looking at documents, as I've done and I had to do for this book, about how actual military leaders were trying to figure out how to integrate these weapons, they just didn't, they didn't know. And the one that they really didn't know about was biological weapons. And they were a little unsure about crop destruction either. What's nice, if we all take our own ethics and put it to the side for a second, if you just think in this mind, mind frame, what's nice about these kinds of weapons and what's scary about these kinds of weapons is that you have no way of knowing whether or not this was done on purpose or if it was just a natural cause. Let me give you an example. I just like to show this slide because it's, it's a cute bug. I think it's cute. Maybe you're the kind of person that only thinks ladybugs are cute, but I would say take off those rose-colored, those ladybug-colored glasses and look at other insects too. This is a cute bug. This is the Colorado beetle, also known as a potato bug. It's cute, but it's horrifying. And you can go back as a historian like I am and look at, at, the, at newspapers in the 19th century and you could see just how horrifying it was because people in Chicago, people in New York are horrified to see that this bug is migrating across the United States. Oh no, it's gotten to St. Louis. Oh no, it's gotten to Chicago. Oh no, it's gotten to wherever. What they're really concerned about is it getting to New York City because once it gets to New York City, all bets are off and this bug is going to go global and it's going to eat up the potatoes everywhere. Potatoes are very important, a very important staple crop. They were really important in feeding people during World War II. And after World War II, it was one of the first instances of an accusation about this kind of environmental warfare. Because what happened was in East Germany and Czechoslovakia, those countries accused the United States of flying over their crops and dropping crates of Colorado beetles. The idea was that they were trying to to bring those economic systems to their knees, to starve those people. And the truth is, there is absolutely no way to, to reconstruct this and to tell whether it was done or not. It could have been done quite easily because all you have to do is take Colorado beetles and just drop them in those, in, in those fields. Um, but it's also very useful politically. Probably the most famous accusation, you haven't heard of the Colorado beetle one necessarily, but the most famous one uh, was during the Korean War where the Americans were accused of wage, waging biological weapons during the Korean War by the Chinese. Uh, and it was a major international controversy. Uh, and major scientists like Joseph Needham, who's a, who's a British uh, scientist and, the, and a French Nobel winning, uh, uh, prize winning scientist, Frederick Joliot Curie, also accused the United States of doing this and said, yes, the United States is waging biological warfare secretly in Korea. Uh, there is absolutely no smoking gun on this and the evidence is circumstantial, but what is very clear from the documents, again, the historical documents, is that the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the U.S. military and the U.S. government learned from this that these kinds of weapons were somehow different because, because of the international controversy, they realized, hey, wait a second, people are thinking about these differently than we're thinking about them. They think that biological weapons are special and they wouldn't necessarily, they shouldn't necessarily be integrated into our uh, our weapon systems uh, as easily as some other weapons would be. But it seems very clear that both the United States and the Soviet Union have the weapons, whether they actually use them or not, in, in, in the Korean War is a separate question, but they had them. They had weaponized them. They had chosen specific pathogens to focus on depending on what outcome they wanted. They want, if, they, if they want to kill a lot of people, easy. Find some place where you have people who have not been exposed to this at all and find the pathogen that will, that will kill as many people as possible. If your goal is actually to, to just bring the economic system down, make sure you debilitate a lot of people. So a lot of hospital resources will be, will be taken up. There are, and, and then my, I shouldn't say my favorite because this makes me sound very grim. My favorite is just seeing in the documents, documents that, or you could use bubonic plague, which has the bonus effect of epidemic disease depending on what you want to do, that you fit that to the environment. Because these weapon systems are there, and this is, I, you, you, you may be getting a sense of why conspiracy theorists are interested in, in my work. You, you don't need a conspiracy theory to believe in this sort of thing. This is a matter of public record. This is, a, this is in declassified uh, documents. This is not circumstantial evidence. You can go find the stuff. You could read, read the book. What's very clear from this is that 
in addition to having these weapon systems, people within the national military establishment in the United States, in the UK, Europe in general, but let's focus on the UK because there's some interesting stories from there, are saying that we need to figure out how vulnerable we are to these kinds of attacks. If this can happen in nature and it can happen due to some sabotage, how do we determine what the difference is? Well, it's very hard to figure out what the difference is. And that's where we can see more of the links about environmental vulnerability. Let me give you just an example. Uh, there is a, 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 a very well-known ecologist named Charles Elton who um, wrote this book, as it says here, The Ecology of Inge Invasions by Animals and Plants. Elton was very influential on Rachel Carson. Elton's work on ecology was all about agricultural defense. And what he wanted, and, he, and there's a reason that he used language like ecology of invasions. He's trying to make the claim that if you want to protect Britain, in his case, if you want to protect British plants, if you want to protect agriculture, what you need to do is take steps to make sure it's not vulnerable. And the worst thing you could do, said Elton, the worst thing that you could do if you're trying to protect your agriculture is to simplify it. Simplifying an ecosystem is the, the easiest way to make it more vulnerable. And by simplifying, uh, by simplifying it, I mean, and, and Elton meant, that you don't diminish the diversity of organisms that are all around. The diversity of animals, diversity of insects and plants, all that stuff. You try to make sure there's as, as much diversity and variety as possible. He called it the conservation of variety. You don't use pesticides to kill everything else just to preserve your one plant. That's, that was his, his, his comment on this. He called it the conservation of variety. Today we would call it biodiversity. Very influential on Rachel Carson's thinking, along, very much along the same lines, but what he's concerned about is protecting those plants from either a purposeful uh, invasion or just a, a sort of natural one. So that's Britain. Also in Britain, one of the things that happened in the early 1950s is a realization within the defense establishment that nobody was prepared for anything like a war that included hydrogen bombs. Now, you may not necessarily know specifically what a hydrogen bomb is. A hydrogen bomb, as they were developed in the 1950s, is different from a, an atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And roughly, they can be made to be a thousand times the size of the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And what the British realized, looking at their very small country, said, look, if, if we are involved in a war that has hydrogen bombs, we just have no way of, of dealing with this at all. In order to survive, forget when, in order to survive and go into the next generation, what do we need? What do we need to survive? Do we try to protect the fish? Well, uh, I don't, uh, maybe we can. Let's do some studies about the, 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 the effects of radio, uh, radioactive contamination on, on fish. Uh, can we protect all the potatoes? And you think I'm joking, but in these documents, yes, they are thinking about fish and chips. They are thinking about ch their potatoes. They're trying to protect the potatoes. They're trying to protect the fish. And they are bummed out that they can't protect the potatoes because potatoes don't preserve. You can't, you can't do this without seed tubers. It's very complicated. And so they start talking about rutabagas, and they're really irritated about that because they think of that as famine food. Um, and the, the, these documents are actually very interesting, trying to figure out what individual things they need to survive. The other one, and this came from an accident, the other one is, has to do with cows, and that's why I have this graphic up here. The cows, in 1957 there was a, um, an accident, there was a fire at the plutonium processing facility at Windscale. So a great deal of radioactive debris went up into the atmosphere and it was a big controversy. You could say this is the first major uh, reactor accident that became international news. Uh, the Windscale fire had a, a, a positive, that's me being positive here, that was very grim, uh, but on the positive side, uh, there are defense planners who are thinking, well, we may have a silver lining here. We have just done something to ourselves that we could never have gotten away with doing. Uh, we have just irradiated, irradiated, our, irradiated ourselves, we have just created this cloud of radioactive debris, and now we can go study what the effects were. And what they found was and this was very disturbing, was that the milk in cows concentrated this radioactivity as well. And that what, and that, what that meant was in a post-nuclear world, there would be no milk, 
there will be no ability to get milk. And so I have spent way too much time. This is where you think, do I really want to be this historian where I have to have this life where I'm reading document after document where for years the British tried to figure out ways, and I hesitate to say this in such a, uh, you know, a a setting such as this because it sounds like we're talking about, well, I'll just say it. They're talking about bull semen. You have these officials going back and forth saying, we have to figure out a way to preserve this bull semen because we believe that after a nuclear war happens, we will go and we will find some cows and we will artificially inseminate them with preserved, genetically superior, uh, uncontaminated bull semen. But they can't figure out how to do it. I mean, they've got underground bunkers going for these cows. They've uh, they've moved to liquid nitrogen instead of carbon dioxide as ways to preserve. It's just, it's, it's a ridiculous, it goes on for years until they finally make the determination that we have got to stop doing this. And instead, they make this really interesting claim. And they say that, you know what? Our best defense and our best insurance for the future is a market economy. Much like the conservation of variety is about biodiversity, they are taking that idea from ecology and applying it to their faith in their economic system. And they're saying, we need to think about a bustling market economy like we have in Britain as being the best defense. We just have to, there's going to be enough different stuff going on in Britain that we will be able to go into the next generation. It's an interesting conceptual shift. Instead of stockpiling those things that they think are really useful, though instead of stockpiling, choosing just a handful of things, fish and chips and, and, and milk, instead, they want to conserve the variety. They want biodiversity to be their goal, and they're connecting it to their thriving market system. You've heard about seed banks. That's what seed banks do. They don't stockpile one or, few, uh, one or a few different things in order to have enough to feed people. Instead, they stockpile lots of different varieties so that in a post-disaster situation, you can go and plant things and you could have the greatest likelihood of those seeds actually, actually thriving. Now, here's uh, Henry Kissinger, part of uh, my Cindy Lauper uh, thing. Um, one of the, the points that I want to make uh, that definitely is in this book is about once you have this notion of catastrophic change happening, what do you do about it? And we know a lot about some of the motivations for international environmental accords, and those include things like what the Americans did in Vietnam. That's what this is. This is Operation Ranch Hand over uh, to the right hand, upper ran- right hand side where the Americans sprayed herbicides on Vietnam for about a decade for a lot of reasons that the military defended. One interesting thing about this is that um, the British did this before. People think of this as an American innovation. Uh, and in the, in the, in the 1960s and in, in early 1970s, when the Americans were doing a lot of research and trying to figure out, oh, can we come up with some new, even better herbicides to kill as many of those uh, plants as possible, uh, the British actually said, well, maybe we should get involved in this. And then older British people at, at Porton, where they were developing this stuff, said, well, what do you mean we should get involved? It was our idea in the first place. We did this in Malaya in the early 1950s during the Malayan emergency, where they actually explicitly were targeting crops to, to kill the crops to starve people out. They actually struggle with this in ways that the Americans never had to struggle with. And this is kind of an aside, but they struggled with this because they said, look, well, we, technically we have ratified the Geneva Protocol against chemical weapons. Is this a chemical weapon? And, and, and uh, they argued at the time, and again, this is in the document, saying, well, if anybody ever challenges us on this, we'll, we will remind them that this is not a war situation that we are simply helping the Malayans deal with their internal problems. Uh, so it doesn't, the Geneva Protocol does not, does not actually, a Geneva con- Convention doesn't, doesn't actually apply. The Americans didn't really have to deal with that. Uh, you, you know, despite how much we rely on this Geneva Convention, we talk about chemical weapons today, when the Americans did this in Vietnam, the Americans had not ratified the Geneva Protocol. Americans didn't do that until the mid-1970s. So the Americans really had nothing, nothing really uh, to be concerned about in, in terms of legality about this. However, the fact that they were doing it motivated a lot of international uh, push to create some kind of um, banning either on the use of herbicides, but also to possibly take weapons of environmental modification off of the table completely. Now, what I want to say, and I'll have to say it briefly, what I want to say about this is that many of the conventions, the agreements that were signed during the 1970s, 
uh, were, were done for very clear political reasons. One of the greatest catastrophic environmentalists was Richard Nixon. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that he was an actual sincere environmentalist. What I'm suggesting is that he really tried to play up the possibility of global harm because it was very useful. One of the things that Richard Nixon was afraid of is that the global environmental movement was going to become a hobby horse for criticizing the United States, particularly its policy in Vietnam, and he was also concerned that people were going to say, for environmental reasons, take nuclear weapons off the table. Neither one of those was something that the United States wanted to do. So it was under Nixon that the United States decided, to say, well, you know what, we're, we're not going to do any more biological weapons. We will not use biological weapons in warfare. Uh, also, it was during this era that Richard Nixon opened up, and it was during the Ford administration that finally the United States ratified the Geneva Protocol against chemical weapons. And it was also during this period where the US and the Soviet Union negotiated this treaty, the Inmod Treaty, to ban the use of environmental weapons. All those crazy ideas that I started, talking, started this talk talking about, we're going to ban them. But don't be fooled, because they didn't ban anything that actually existed. They, they ended up banning a lot of things that was science fiction. And the things that motivated the treaty, like herbicide spraying in Vietnam, like weather manipulation in Vietnam and, and other places, didn't actually get banned. Because behind the scenes, you had to have long-lasting and severe weapon systems that, to, to, to qualify for being banned. So things like steering a hurricane, sure, let's ban that. We're not really getting rid of anything because we don't know how to do that yet. Uh, so, but we're not going to get rid of nuclear weapons. We're certainly not going to get, we're not going to make illegal or implicate the United States uh, by, by saying, yes, we agree we should not have done that for 10 years. The larger point that I, I want to make, and here we go. The larger point that I want to make, this relates to the British, you know, sort of seeing a connection between biodiversity and their economic system, is that the United States, the British, it was, it's very clear by the 1970s and 1980s that the economic system itself seems to be the answer to environmental problems, largely because the Western economic system seems a lot more like ecological diversity than the Soviet one does. Have a look at Africa in the 1980s. Now, I grew up, uh, you know, in, in the late 70s, in 1980s, and I was constantly seeing these commercials on TV, and you probably remember the commercials I'm talking about, where there is, some, there is a starving child uh, in Ethiopia. Famine in Africa ceased to be news in the 1980s. It was just something people accepted. This actually started in the early 1970s. There was this major drought in the Sahel region of sub-Saharan Africa that, oh, there's a drought. People are, are, are hungry. Year after year, that drought didn't go away. Then it became disturbing. Is this a new normal in Africa? What do we do about this? Did humans cause this? Is there something that we humans did somehow that caused, uh, caused this drought? This is a, a, a long-standing question in Africa. By the mid-1980s, it's just, it got crazy. The CIA, if you look at CIA documents from this period, they are marveling in Africa because they do not understand what has happened, but they have an interesting way of interpreting it. First, you have the drought in Ethiopia. Then you have a famine, so people are starving. You have this apocalyptic scenario. And then, after a couple of years, the rains come. And what happens when the rains come? You think that's a good thing, things start to grow, and then all of a sudden, you've got perfect breeding grounds for locusts. And locust swarms take over Africa, and they start eating all the food, and you have a new disaster situation. And this is horrible. And then, to cap it all off, you have the AIDS epidemic strike in about 1986. So you have rampant disease throughout Africa. You've got these biological organisms, these locusts, eating everything up. You've got no rain, and when there is rain, it's really bad. How do you interpret this? Well, let me tell you how the, the CIA interpreted this. They said, look, climate change, the scientists are telling us climate is changing. And this is a different period. They're not denying climate change. They're saying, okay, 
Scientists are telling us this. Let's, let's figure out what's going to happen. And they're looking at lots of different parts of the world. And one thing that is kind of comforting to the CIA and others during this period is that you could look at grain regions of the Soviet Union and say, you know what? Climate change is going to be really bad for the Soviet Union. Not only is it going to really hurt their grain regions, but because they are a centralized government with not a diverse economy at all, they are not going to be able to adjust. They are not going to be able to adapt uh, to any kind of major climate change, unlike the United States and the West, because our market economies are inherently adaptable. Just look at Africa. You've got these Soviet-backed regimes like Ethiopia that cannot handle crises. They cannot deal with it. Now, here, here's Cindy Lauper, Michael Jackson. Who else have we got here? We've got Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, Lionel Richie, you're murmuring, trying to help me. I appreciate that. Um, Willie Nelson and uh, Tina at the top. All of them, you remember the song, we are the world, we are the children, we are the ones who make a brighter day, so let's start giving, right? CIA documents say, you know, all the giving that happened, this is the British version of it right here. There's another song. Do they know? Oops, sorry. Uh, I think this was, I can't, I can't remember the song. Do they know it's Christmas, maybe? The, the money that was given, the food that was given, was requisitioned by the government and used not as bribery, but as a way of trying to convince people to move to different parts of the, com- uh, of the country. There were warlords who tried to use food to get people to come to their side. This was, from the point of view of intelligence officers, uh, a manufactured crisis that, was, that, that started out being nature-caused but was just exacerbated by regimes that were unable to do anything about it or unwilling to do anything about it. So you could say it was natural. You could even maybe even say that it was human, it was anthropogenic in the sense of climate change in general being anthropogenic, but the disaster was, 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 was something that humans did, that specific kinds of governments were doing, that, which just reinforced the way that they were already thinking about uh, adjusting to climate change. Now, there are many side stories to tell about this, and it's not really my goal in this, in this talk or my book to criticize people who believe in economic adaptation. It's not my goal. Uh, and I'm not trying to criticize people who play up catastrophic environmental rhetoric like Nixon did. You know, after Nixon, the greatest environmental person in the White House was Al Gore when he was vice president. Similar rhetoric about the, the dangers uh, that we all face from a global a global threat. I use that as just food for thought, not necessarily uh, to criticize, though. What I want to do in this talk and in my book is to show how the experience of the Cold War, specifically that scientific and military collaboration about weapons and then vulnerability to change, provided a worldview about change and vulnerability that's so central to our environmental views uh, and how we respond to them today. So, thank you. I'd be happy to take questions. I've been asked not to call on anybody myself. So I'm just going just gonna to stand here. And with the lighting, I can't see anybody. So I presume there are people out there. Up here. Oh, I know. Uh, here. What's bad about... Where are you? Uh, here. Oh, okay. What's bad about having the views of environmental concern uh, influenced by the military? What's bad about it? Yes. Are they giving us a distorted view? Are they saying that climate change is not going to occur, is not occurring, or that we shouldn't do anything about it? What's the difference if they, in the 70s, uh, imposed a military regime, a military point of view on that? Well, I'm not trying to say there's anything bad about it having its origins. I guess I don't... uh, (laughs) That's a good question. I, I, I'm try- you're wondering about what kind of values I'm putting on this. You know, why, why should we care whether this came from the military or not? Am I understanding that right? Uh, and I think there are many ways of answering that. One is, first of all, we don't typically think of it uh, we, you, uh, as something that came from this collaboration. When we think about it, 
we think about patronage. People are, are comfortable with the idea that the military paid for a lot of research. That's okay. Uh, that seems to be something that people are okay with. But what I think scientists today and environmentalists in particular today feel challenged by is the idea that the ideas came from this need to understand how to manipulate, to understand whether anthropogenic change is possible on a large scale, and to understand what our vulnerabilities to it are. So that you could, instead of looking to someone like Paul Ehrlich and the Population Bomb or Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, instead of looking to them as the, the beginning of even thinking about these things, you do need to challenge yourself to think about, actually, it's in the 1950s or earlier when this research is coming out and people are saying, gee, uh, we're extremely vulnerable for precisely the reasons that became much more public in, in other people's hands later. Was the period of the 50s and 60s and early 70s the period when, when, when military research scientists finally found out that the, the world is in, interconnected as a whole planet environmentally? The, the question is, was the period of the, of the 50s... And 60s and early 70s the first time that the science community found out that the world is connected as a whole planet environmentally? Was, was this the first time that they thought about these things? No, no. Uh, if you think about, uh, it certainly is not the first time people have been thinking about uh, global connections in, environmentally. And I'm not trying to make the claim that suddenly this happened only at this time. What I'm trying to look at is that, is that collaboration and also seeing some of the results of that collaboration. So, for example, the, if I can sort of re-emphasize the economic connection, some of the earliest criticisms of the environmental worldview were of uh, people who just didn't think the environments were taking economics that seriously. So in the early 1970s, some of the first major models of environmental change on a global scale were developed by people who had cut their teeth on military models and, and trying to understand the effects of nuclear weapons and trying to understand the catastrophic things like fallout distribution. And they turn their eyes to, okay, well, let's, let's plug in different kinds of variables. Let's look at some environmental things. Let's look at population. Let's look at lots of different things. And when they did that, these were the, you know, one of the most famous results of this were two books, one called World Dynamics and the other one was called The Limits to Growth, which some of you may have heard of. It was much more famous. The primary criticism of that by economists was, look, what you're not taking into account is, is, is price adjustments. You're not taking into account the things that, the, the adjustments in general that people make when, when costs go up and, and there, are, there are different kinds of uh, resources that are, that are available. That's called economics. And we've been dealing with that for a really long time. And it was during that period that you have Yes, you have an understanding about global environmental problems, but you also get this major critique of environmentalists that is a long-standing one uh, ever since the early 1970s. Um, so it seems like we're saddled with this narrative from the military of, about global economic catastrophe. Do you think it makes sense to try to develop different narratives from the military narrative, or is the global economic uh, environmental catastrophe the one we still need to basically use in our thinking and our discussion of the environment? This is such a great question. It's the uncomfortable question, right? I mean, you, there is the, there is the uh, challenging this narrative that we have come to a point of having a global crisis, I, if I'm understanding the spirit of it right. Um, and, you know, when I was writing the book, I really had to face this. Uh, and um, because people, when I would describe, oh, I'm looking at the, the military origins of thinking this way. And they would look at me and say, so are you a climate change denier? And I, and I thought, well, what an odd question. Um, I, I, no, I'm not a climate change denier. And, and I do think that science is valuable, but a lot of it is science of a different kind, of a certain kind, about change and, and manipulability. And I do think that the questions that scientists ask are important in shaping the way that we look at the world. And it so happens that the way we look at the world is very catastrophic, military influenced, uh, and, and it's, it's very crisis oriented. Uh, and I'm not denying those crises. I'm a product of that time as well. But the questions do matter. So I, I, this is a sort of wishy-washy 
answer to your question. Do we need to challenge the narrative? We need to understand that that narrative has an origin and maybe challenge it. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's fuel for the fire of denying uh, the reality of, of the problems that we face. What, what, um, what is the most important um, conse consequence that you, that, that you see yourself out of what you've told us, what you, your research, for uh, those who are concerned about the environment? In other words, what, are the, what is the implication that matters the most to you or that seems to be the significance of it for that? This is a great question. What's a real consequence? What matters most to me that I've seen from this, right? Um, l let me give you just a, 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 a little answer to this. And then I mentioned the spraying of herbicides in Vietnam and the destruction that was happening in Vietnam. And, and, and there was a war going on in Vietnam that was enormously destructive. And there were also scientists who started to call this ecocide and started to change the conversation. This is sort of relevant to what you're asking. Started to change the conversation and say, you know what's happening in Vietnam is a really a global problem. We need to think about the global uh, consequences of our environmental actions. We need to think about the Earth as, as one unit and to think of this as, as something to take to the UN and, and describe more generally as a catastrophic potential change to the Earth. Uh, and in doing that, and this was very useful, and just bear in mind who it's useful for. It was very useful for the Nixon administration to do that. The Nixon administration was very keen on supporting the UN Environment Program, which was created after the, 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 the 1972 Stockholm Conference. They were worried that the, the Swedes were going to make this a vehicle for anti-American agitation. And they decided that they wanted to get ahead of it, get in front of it and very explicitly said, we're going to help create this environment program. In fact, we're going to finance it. We're going to pay the money so we can redirect that conversation. The reason that's relevant to your, your question is because instead of focusing on what was happening in Vietnam, instead of focusing on the immense ecological destruction and loss of life and possible carcinogenic effects of all these things, people were talking about that, but it changed the conversation and made it more of a global problem. And so I think if you were looking for a takeaway from myself, for, for all of us, we have these, these crises, but they're not always global ones. Often they're, they're, they're local ones, or often they're regional ones, and that we do need to be concerned about environmental security and access to water and all the things that, that, that are possible war causers. Those are things we should focus on and, and, and possibly resist making it all catastrophic all the time. Thank you. You've actually addressed my question, but perhaps I can expand it a bit. How can an individual like myself or other individuals here today do something? Obviously, we're not going to be able to do anything with the military and so on. What individually or within our particular town or social group or activity do? Well, I mean, you're asking a great question and, and, and sort of I feel like you're answering the question by asking it that way. What can you do in your own town, in your own community, and pay attention to, to those issues? I think we should all pay attention to the, the global issues, sure. Uh, but you know, to make it even more personal, last, last year I, mean, I was doing s some interviews about the, a book and saying, what, what can we do? And, and the environmental security comes up a lot. My, my, uh, if you have this, I have this connection to Colorado Springs. Most of my extended family lives there. And for the past two summers, just wildfires have been enormously destructive in burning down homes. My own parents lost their house in Colorado Springs. Environmental security is extremely important in, in a place like that. And they need to be concerned about water. They need to be concerned about what they're doing. So I'm not trying to say we don't have environmental problems, but thinking, I don't want to say think globally, act locally, because it sounds like such a, um, we've heard that before, but definitely be thinking about the larger problems, but get involved in understanding how your own community, and, the, and not just your own community, but also the communities that you care about, which could be anywhere in the world, uh, what the specific challenges are there. Yeah, hi. You gave uh, some good examples, I think, of the, uh, the US and the UK and the Western uh, uh, militaries and, and the things that they were considering. I'm wondering in your research if you came across, uh, or you know, maybe what were some interesting things on the Soviet side of, of in that Cold War era that uh, might be of interest. Yeah, on the Soviet side, um, 
So there are a few things to mention on the Soviet side. Um, first of all, the Soviets had a, a major biological weapons program as well. Uh, and so they were doing many of the same things. And in fact, rumors or intelligence about what the Soviets were doing motivated a lot of what the Americans did. That's not the same as, say as saying, though, that the Soviets actually had these programs. What you'll see constantly, especially in the, in, in the cases I was starting with, with environmental warfare and trying to imagine the different things we could possibly do, um, it's constantly mentioned, well, the Soviets are planning to, ban to, 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 build a, um, to dam up the Bering Strait, uh, and that they are going to use that as a way of controlling things. And, and the Soviets are planning to possibly melt the ice caps. Uh, but actual knowledge of what they were planning to do is, 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 is spotty. Um, the Soviets believed that AIDS was concocted uh, in American biological weapons laboratories. I mean, that's a conspiracy theory from the other side. Um, so it, it goes back and forth, but a lot of it is just rumor. Uh, and so but what we do know definitely uh, is a very robust biological weapons program uh, extending beyond the period that the Americans gave up their offensive biological capabilities. Can you describe what the current level of engagement is by the U.S. military in uh, research and implementation of programs regarding environmental security? Uh, yes, uh, I, I can't give you specific details about it. I mean, I, you, you threw me with by saying environmental security at the end, uh, and I thought you were going to ask me weather control and all that other stuff. And I, what I was going to answer to that particular question uh, is that um, there isn't a, a huge difference between biological weapons research and biodefense. We have a lot of biodefense. You know, most offensive, uh, offensive biological weapons research is what? We're not necessarily making new diseases. We're relying on the diseases ha that have been in human populations for, for a heck of a long time, longer before there were biological weapons programs. So it, it really matters how you characterize the kind of research that's being done. So yeah, we have a lot of biodefense research being done as well. Similarly, we have research on, on the effects of uh, everything that we do on weather and climate. Um, it's not necessarily meaning that we're planning to to, to do these kinds of uh, these things, where we do have very explicit programs is in environmental security, but it's sort of a poor cousin. There's actually a, of, of what we think of as conventional national security issues. Um, there, are, there are a number of people who are very interested in environmental security issues, and I personally, I applaud that. I mean, because I think that's an actual thing that we need to be concerned about, people's access to food, people's access to water, and how that, has, how that can possibly lead to conflict. Um, and some people call this new security. And it's not new, it's, it's quite old, but I'm happy for people to call it new security if that gets them, gets them interested in it. But yes, there definitely is some support of that. What I wanted to ask you is like, uh, the armed forces, military has had lots of money for research into things like this. Today, we have globalized corporations which are larger than most countries of the world who have enormous resources to conduct similar research. A lot of the environmental damage is not military as much because we've not had major wars. So all this money that is spent around the world by these companies where they have created a lot of disasters as you travel around the world, and water is one of them. In cities that I have visited in India, they say a lot of the water actually goes to humongous coke plants that the people cannot get to drink. What from. kind of plant? It goes to what plants? Coke. Coca-Cola, oh, oh, like, Coca -Cola. you know, they have enormous usage of water. And people think that water might be the next source of war and not oil. So in a globalized world where global corporations run enormous amounts with enormous wealth, have lots of research capabilities, it, is, it has implications on our environment, on our food. So what, where do you think we will go? What does the global environmental movement or whether a global food movement go from here so that they can have a much more secure world for themselves. All I can do as, as an answer to that, um, all I can do is just agree with everything you said. Uh, and, and that yes, we have many resource, we're gonna have conflict over resources. And, and if your question is about what are we gonna do about the fact that corporations control a lot of these resources, I don't know is the answer. Uh, but I definitely agree that in the future, water access 
uh, is going to be as important and probably more important as time goes on uh, than, than access to petroleum and other sources like that. Um, how the military will be involved or how you and I as citizens uh, of, of, of the world or as, as of the United States will be involved, that's, that remains to be seen. Give us a quick second as she makes her way up there. Wait, they raise their hand. We can see that hand again, though. I lost it. There he is. That gives me a chance to grab some water here. I still miss exactly what your major point is. It's, I, the research that you did and what the military did and how they tried to make a, an environmental change uh, operate as a weapon is interesting. But what does that have to do, that realization have to do with what needs to be done today? If we need to minimize the amount of uh, carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere, then we need to do it regardless of whether the in initial ideas came from a military scientific collaboration. If we need to minimize the use of coal, we need to do it now because of things that are happening in the environment now. What, what are you trying to have us do that's different? Uh, no, uh, it, it's, it's sort of a fair question. It, and uh, in that I, uh, I am trying to make this case about the past. I'm a historian. And uh, I'm trying to challenge the way that we understand how we got here. Uh, and that I want people to, to, to see this in the way that we think about the world, the way that we think about environmental issues, particularly the, the global catastrophic ones, is rooted in these, these efforts, these plans, and that we wouldn't necessarily be here uh, in, in terms of the way that we think had this not happened. It's not necessarily that I'm trying to get you to change your view that we need to stop global warming. Not at all. As I said, I'm not a climate change denier. I'm trying to get us to rethink, uh, rethink how we understand, understand the past. <clears throat> um, adding on to that question. Uh, Where are you? It's not clear to me. Oh, sorry. Here. Thank you. It's not clear to me um, how we can gain further access to whatever the military uh, with their scientific collaborators is doing. And you kind of indicated that it isn't, wasn't easy for you either. Uh, so, you know, we know that there's something, there's something in their thinking, but how do, we, how do we even track it? How do we get to know it better? How do we get to identify that from the well-motivated um, environmental uh, actions that we're in favor for? So, I mean, you're, the access to the information we need seems to be difficult. So, can you give us any clues as to how we can see what the government is thinking so we can evaluate it? Well, I mean, a, a practical answer to that, I mean, my, my flippant answer was, you can read my book, but the, uh, the practical answer is, is more serious, and that is that uh, we have, we do, fortunately, we do have tools for getting this information. The Freedom of Information Act has been incredibly useful. I've definitely used it, uh, and, that, and it is about, uh, you know, about past events, uh, but it definitely will help you help get access to this stuff. And I can't emphasize enough that understanding how these things happened in the past will inform understanding of how they're happening now. Uh, and, and, and you may be the kind of person that thinks, well, tell me, what, what, can you do, you know, what have you done for me lately? Janet Jackson. I already talked about Michael Jackson. You know, what have you done for me lately? Uh, you know, okay, do something in the future. Tell us about what we can do now. What I do is to, to, to understand what happened in the past and how we got here. I mean, just imagine this. In the 1950s, you had people all of a sudden after nuclear tests began. People were saying, well, is this having an effect on, on our natural environment? And they go to scientists and they say, is this having an effect on our natural environment? And they say, um, I don't know, because we've never taken global measurements before. Uh, we've, we have no idea what the normal ocean even looks like if we're trying to gauge it's the difference between normal and having a lot of radioactive uh, waste in it or, or debris from fallout, and it's in that period where they start paying attention to it, and they start tracking it. We, we've, the, the, if you look at global um, climate change and look at the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 
That started in that military context. The, the Keeling curve, it's not all of a sudden scientists had this bright idea, we need to start thinking about this. Instead, it was monitoring, trying to figure out how we're going to keep track of the Soviet nuclear tests, or how we're going to understand the circulation of the stuff in the atmosphere, how we're going to militarize the environment. We need to understand what's happening in the environment. We need to start measuring the Earth, not because we care about what the Earth, the, the shape of the Earth, is because we literally don't know where Moscow is, so if we want to point a missile at it, we need to have a better idea of how it's going to get there and get there accurate, accurately. I can't emphasize enough how much of environmental science, the civilian side, just could not compete with the military side. So much so that when the Cold War ended, Al Gore said, you know, we've got a lot of data that's classified. Let's go in there and try to take stuff that we don't think needs to be classified anymore so that more and more scientists can use it. This was called the Minerva Project, to try to just declassify all this stuff. And if you're interested in global positioning, if you're interested in GIS, you're interested in, in using your, your, your iPhone, that stuff has a military origin, uh, that, and we're still struggling. As historians, we're still struggling to understand what that means for us today. Does it just mean that thanks to the military, or does that mean that we are still living with the legacy of how that makes us think? I don't have a definitive answer for it, but it's so crucial that we ask it. And the first step in asking it is to recognize the, the, the context and recognize the origins. We're going to take the last question on your right. I was just wondering, since the United States had a trend where it always wanted to have more that it expanded to, that you know, once you were done going west, then you had the development of the space program ultimately, right? And I guess hearing what you described sounds more like a hysteria and a fear that we have nowhere to go. Like, this is all we have is this planet or our space as a country. And so we have to protect what we have or hurt what other people have in order to get it, right? And so I was just wondering kind of the cultural context that at the same time that the Soviets and the United States are worrying about biological warfare, they're also trying to go to the moon and just kind of how... Oh, it's such a great point. I mean, I, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as, as I can on this. I mean, because there is this notion of the frontier and, and, in science. I mean, one of the principal documents that we rely on at the National Science Foundation is this notion of basic research, and it comes from a document called Science, the Endless Frontier that was penned at the end of the Second World War. We have this notion of, of the science being, uh, being the frontier. And in the 50s, when, when, the, when there was a, an, uh, a uh, geophysicist who, who discovered the radiation belts around the, uh, around the Earth, it was this phenomenal discovery. Wow, there are these weird radiation belts around the Earth. The first instinct that he had was let's see what happens when a hydrogen bomb explodes in it. Uh, and, and he helped to design the experiment to do the high altitude nuclear test to do precisely that. And what happened was it created another uh, radiation belt that lasted a heck of a lot longer than any scientist realized w it would last. And it was that test and others like it around that time where people started saying, hey, wait a second, M maybe it's not just a frontier where we can kind of do new in interesting things, but th this is having a lasting effect and that we need to start paying attention far more to the possible long-lasting and severe effects from the kinds of things that we do. I mean, it's a scary period when you look back to think that there was this mentality of not really having an effect when the, when the tool or the toy is the hydrogen bomb, uh, but, but that, that was what was going on in the 50s and in, in, in early 1960s. And I, I think today, fortunately, we, we have a culture where that's not necessarily the case. However, don't get too complacent about it, because that's essentially what geoengineering is, trying to get use science and technology to try to have a technological fix to a problem that is global in scope with some kind of faith that you will be able to predict all the consequences, which I find to be mind-numbingly, I don't want to offend people who are in, interested in engineering, but mind-numbingly um, misguided uh, if you have the historical context. That's a nice question to end on. Thanks.